they always talk about the five gyres, mm -hmm. like the, the places where the plastic really accumulates in the big oceans. And by now, the Mediterranean itself is actually considered the sixth gyre. Oh, wow. Simply because, well, judging from the last years that I spent sailing in the Mediterranean, it's near impossible to ever be on a boat anywhere out there without seeing any plastics. So if you stand on deck, you turn around the full 360 degrees, you always see something, be it a bottle or a canister or just a plastic bag. But there's always trash around, which is pretty incredible and, well, horrifying, really. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm here with Manuel from Project Manea, which is a small NGO which works on marine conservation. We chat about the amazing work he's done in the past 15 years plus of being a marine biologist, how the Mediterranean is the area of water which requires the most attention right now, and the current projects of documenting the invasive species in the areas, the seagrass depletion, which is one of the keystone habitats in the area, as well as the marine debris. Can you imagine that anywhere you go on the Mediterranean, you cannot be there without seeing plastic trash? That is absolutely heartbreaking for me. But luckily, there's people like Manuel and many other marine biologists who are all dedicated to protect our oceans. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this episode, you learned something, and maybe get inspired to go to the Mediterranean once the travel bans have been lifted and check out the amazing work they are doing. As per usual, it would mean the world to me if you could leave this podcast a thumbs up or, you know, a rating on wherever you're watching it, listening to it. Uh, it means the world to me. It's still a relatively new podcast. And yeah, if you could help me support the work I do, you can donate some money, become a patron, or get yourself a Plastic Is the Killer t-shirt, proceeds from which go to marine ocean cleanups and other ocean related projects so yeah thank you guys so much for listening every day there's a new news story about the crisis facing our ocean whether it's the plastic issue overfishing pollution if the oceans die we die fortunately we have plenty of environmental activists marine conservationists and eco warriors who are out there every day fighting to protect our oceans and our earth on the Ocean Pancake Podcast, we're going to be hearing from some of them about how to decrease our environmental footprint, go plastic-free, participate in ocean conservation, cleanups, and even maybe some marine science. So, welcome to the Ocean Pancake Podcast, where the goal is sustainability and living a turquoise life. My name is Kat Andreskova, and I'm your host today. Let's get into this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Ocean Pancake Podcast. Today I'm here with Manuel, who is from Project Manaya. This is a small marine NGO which focuses on um, marine biology out in the Mediterranean. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to finally get a chance to talk to you. I mean, I found you on YouTube now like two, three years ago, uh, and it's been so cool to see your journey of everything you guys have been doing. Oh, I didn't know you found us that long ago. It's yeah, good to hear. It's been a long time. Um, and I've actually been wanting to get on your boat soon. So maybe once all this craziness is over and done with. <laughs> nice. Would be good to have you. Um, so tell us your story. What was the first time you fell in love with the ocean? How did you start working in marine science? Oh, so... The first time I really fell in love with the ocean was a long time ago. So I've learned snorkeling way before I learned swimming, really. Oh. So that was when I was about three years old. But when it really happened was when we went on vacation to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And I saw coral reefs for the first time and I was just blown away. And I decided then, when I was eight years old, I think, that that's what I want to do. I want to spend my life underwater exploring something that's down there and very much to the amusement of everybody around me coming from a landlocked country like Austria it's not the most common career path I guess and well kind of kept chasing the dream studied biology in Graz in Austria 
then went to northern Germany to actually be at the ocean while studying marine biology. Spent half a year in Egypt collecting my da data for a thesis and then kind of stumbled straight onto the Greenpeace ships for a good 15 years and eventually decided that I really want to focus on solutions rather than pointing out problems and started my own little marine conservation NGO. And that brought me to Thailand and Myanmar first for a couple of years until the political situation there kind of got very much out of hand and we sort of retreated back to the Mediterranean, which when it comes to ocean conservation, for me is really the hotspot or ground zero or call it whatever you want. But it is one of the spots where you have all the issues that any ocean anywhere in the world would have, just in more condensed sort of met, uh, way. And that's why I figured if we find solutions that work in the Mediterranean, we can apply them anywhere else in the world. So that's how we kind of ended up in the Mediterranean. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. I remember last time I was in the Mediterranean, I was so heartbroken and disappointed just with the amount of trash I saw and the lack of fish. Um, so I'm guessing those are a couple of the things you guys are looking into while out there? It's definitely part of the list. Um, well, the Mediterranean has more than 20 countries bordering it. So there's a lot more trash than in most places of the world. And actually when it comes to people working on plastics pollution, they always talk about the five gyres, mm -hmm. like the, the places where the plastic really accumulates in the big oceans. And by now the Mediterranean itself is actually considered the sixth gyre. Oh, wow. Simply because, well, judging from the last years that I spent sailing in the Mediterranean, it's near impossible to ever be on a boat anywhere out there without seeing any plastics. So if you stand on deck, you turn around the full 360 degrees, you always see something, be it a bottle or a canister or just a plastic bag. But there's always trash around, which is pretty incredible and, well, horrifying, really. And, yeah, same is true for fisheries, simply because you have so many bordering countries, the pressure is a lot higher. Mm -hmm. Plus, in the summertime, you have so many tourists and they all want to eat the, well, the local caught yeah. fish which really is more of an illusion than anything else. So even the tavernas that say, we have fresh local caught fish every day, only a fraction of the fish that they are selling is actually from the Mediterranean. And the majority of it is imported from, I don't know, the North Sea or anywhere else in the world, simply because the Mediterranean can't supply the amount of fish that is actually sold and bought in the Mediterranean area during the summertime. It's just no way it's ever possible. And do you hmm? see it as like the biggest issues facing the Mediterranean? Is it this like um, just overuse of resources because there's so many countries there? What, what are the things? Uh, there's a couple of issues that I boil it down to. I mean, the overuse definitely one because there's just so much consumption in a very small body of water, mm -hmm. but also the amazing amount of influx from, well, garbage, of course but also nutrients from agriculture all around it. But then you also have a whole different side where global warming kind of plays into the game as well. And more than 100 years ago now, the Suez Canal was open, so the connection down to the Red Sea. And that basically opened the gateway for well, the, all the tropical species to kind of swim into the Mediterranean. And in previous times, there was a couple of natural barriers so the Suez Canal used to go through the salt lakes, they were called. So very salty body of water. So a fish couldn't just swim through. Mm -hmm. But now that the Suez Canal has been, been uh, reconstructed over and over again, and now it's so much bigger than it used to be, basically the salt all washed out and there's no barrier anymore. And then the second barrier was the Neil River that comes into the Mediterranean, which was bringing so much fresh water that the fish couldn't swim through. But now there's a couple of dams in between. So that's not a barrier anymore either. And now you have all these invasive species that are basically running in from the Red Sea. And by now we're counting more than a thousand in the Mediterranean. And they are spreading at a massive rate. And well, one of them is the lionfish, which mm -hmm. is known to be a pest in the Caribbean already. And two years ago, I remember we saw the first one in Crete. And last year, when we went down there again in the summertime, it was near impossible to do a dive where you wouldn't see at least 50, 60 sometimes of them in a single dive. And they are basically 
knocking out all the other biodiversity. And if you look at the studies from the Caribbean or other parts of the world, the evidence is that they have the potential to wipe out about 75% of the marine biodiversity in the location where they show up. So that's a whole different kind of pressure showing up from the other side of the mat. And yeah. that I think is one of the big issues that it's struggling with as well. So there's definitely quite a few issues there. I know I recently did a podcast episode all about lionfish. So if anyone's interested in learning more about how lionfish are um, impacting local environments, and this is in the Caribbean and why they are such a big threat, make sure to check that one out. Um, they, you know, they've actually developed robots to hunt them over there. Yeah, I saw that. I actually got in touch with the guys but they have so much higher densities than us in the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier. I mean, all in all, they are very easy to hunt because they just, yeah, they just don't care them. about divers or anybody else because they know nobody's going to touch them. So you can get really close to them before they actually start swimming away. And especially when we went around with the ROV, like we have a small open ROV, it's called. Mm -hmm. And you could actually bump into them with it. They just don't care at all. Um, one of the nice things we did see about them, though, is in the Med, we have a couple of old marine protected areas. Mm -hmm. One of them is in Sakuntos in Greece. So you just have areas where the local marine biodiversity is really in good shape. So you have all the big groupers, you have a couple of sharks, you have the turtles, you have all of it there. And even though the invasive species do show up in those areas, they don't really manage to spread a lot there simply because there's other big fish that kind of push them out of the area, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason why I believe the big solution really would be to have healthy local fish stocks. And then the invasive species will show up, but they can't really spread that much. Yeah, so, they'll be kept down by the natural balances within the ecosystem. Exactly that. And in order to have a good, healthy local system, you need seagrass, which is just the ultimate keystone habitat in the Mediterranean because it's the place where most local fish grow up. It's the hiding spot for all the juveniles. It is the ultimate breeding ground for pretty much everything in the Med. And that's part of the reason why this season, actually, we are trying to start growing seagrass on a bigger scale and involve dive centers in replanting it and well, bring the idea out there that this is really the habitat we have to take care of. That's very cool. Um, so could you tell us some of the other aims of Project Manaya? Manaya? Sorry, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> uh, Manaya it is. Manaya. It's actually nicked from the New Zealand or from the Maori culture. Mm -hmm. It's the spiritual guardian of the seas. So just the Maori goddess. Perfect. Um, very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, kind of fits the purpose. Um, well, our projects right now are three that we want to really focus on. One of them is documenting the invasive species. So we're trying to pull in all the sailors, all the dive centers, all the water sports enthusiasts that are moving in the Mediterranean and get them to report sightings back to us. So we actually have a better idea of how far the spread has gone. And that focusing on a handful of key species, really. So they are all very easy to identify. So everybody who sees them in the water will instantly know, okay, that's the one. Just so we can actually use the sightings, very reliable. Um, another one is the seagrass. Mm -hmm. So for one, we want to know where it's getting less, which is in many parts of the Mediterranean, unfortunately. But also we want to involve the bigger communities to actually help us to replant it. Because even though we can do it on our own, we can only do that much every year. And if all of a sudden you have a couple of hundred or a few thousand divers who help you in, the, in this process, it just makes your work so much more efficient. So that's why we're trying to pull in all these people. And the third one, of course, is the marine debris. So all the plastics, all the trash, everything that ends up in the ocean. And we organize cleanups together with dive centers, together with schools, with uh, local clubs, with all sorts of communities to get all this trash out of the ocean again but then not just throw it in the dumpster, but actually put it back to use and try to make something useful out of it once again. Yeah, create that circular economy because just diverting to landfill is not gonna help. 
Exactly that. So for people who haven't, you know, seen you guys on YouTube or anything, can you describe a bit more about the project? Who's involved? What does it look like? And a bit about your boat? Um, well, we are still a rather small NGO, I have to confess. So right now it's two people who work full time on it. That's Pinal, my wife and myself. So we, in theory, live on the boat pretty much nonstop. Right now, we unfortunately got stuck in Austria and we are unable to reach back to the boat because of well, the current situation. But the two of us are actually nonstop on the boat, sailing around the Mediterranean and getting in touch with all sorts of other NGOs. We work with them, we support them in terms of giving them a floating platform to work from, which is our boat. It's a 14 meter steel sailboat. So pretty sturdy, very solid little thing and big enough to host up to seven people, which we did in the past many times. So for example, last year we had a couple of uh, dolphin researchers on the boat for a good month or five weeks it was in total. And we did, for example, the very first marine mammal survey that was actually crossing three of the Mediterranean seas, which hasn't been done before. So actually, it doesn't take a big NGO or big research center to do groundbreaking new work that hasn't been done before. It just mm -hmm. takes a couple of dedicated people who come up with a good idea and just make it happen. But by now, we're also lucky enough to have a few extra hands that are in the, or not in the field with us all the time, but that work from home with us and just put in a couple of hours every week and in return they get to come on board for a week or two every year and join us on the boat as well it is integral that we continue supporting ngos and organizations such as project manaya which prioritize our planet and that is why this episode is sponsored by modi body which is a feminine hygiene company which specializes in underwear and swimwear, which you can use as alternatives or in addition to other menstrual products that you may use every single month. But they are the ultimate alternative to single-use plastics and they support other women in need. So head on over to Modi Body Vegan Diver 10 for a 10% discount on your first purchase. Feel comfortable and be doing good things for the earth. Now back to Project Manaya. You, you were telling me in one of the aims of the project is to make research more accessible and cheaper um, since we need to gather data because that's the best thing we can do at this point is learn more about the oceans to learn how to help them. So what kind exactly. of other projects have you guys um, taken part in or helped uh, in the past few years, especially when you were, you know, in the other countries? So one of the big things we did was in Myanmar. So Myanmar still is obviously still opening up. Some people might still remember it as Burma rather than Myanmar, but it's basically a very much less developed country just north of Thailand. And in Myanmar, there's this Meguia Archipelago. So it's a chain of a good 800 islands that just follow along the coast. And it's absolutely gorgeous area. And at the time, very few boats had an actual permit to go into this island group. So when we started, there was, I think, 20 boats that had the written permit from the government to actually move in that area at all. And we were lucky enough to come across one of the boats that had this permit. And we did the first kind of baseline surveys of the area, which meant <laughs> at the time, ultimately, was just going out there, going snorkeling, uh, hiking the islands and taking pictures of everything that we saw, which was a lot of stuff and afterwards we just spent weeks and weeks on the internet trying to work out what the heck it was that we all saw and bottom line was that we did find a couple of endangered species we even found a coral species that was meant to be gone by now so the, the, it took me about a month to work out what exactly it was because we couldn't find it in any of the coral books and then by accident, really, I stumbled across one old book that had it in it. I was like, whoa, okay. And then I researched a little bit more and found out that it was meant to be extinct about 15 years ago. 
and we found massive fields of it just completely packed and then actually paid a lot of attention to not mention where exactly in the archipelago we found it because of it's one of the little bit of the drawbacks of marine biology if you find something that's absolutely unique and really stunning lots of people will go there and want to see it yeah. and that's always bringing a danger of actually losing it so that was the Megui archipelago and we actually started a big coral nursery and a coral garden there actually repurposing old discarded fishing gear that was washed up on beaches and just showed up as marine debris again so they are these fish traps, basically wooden frames covered in fishing nets. And we basically filled them with old dead pieces of coral and then just wove in little pieces of coral that are still alive but were broken off from big storms or from boat damage. And those now that we are about three years later, they look stunning. So the coral there is growing like crazy and the frame basically vanished underneath and it really works well. And oh, this great. island actually turned out to be the first marine protected area and no take zone in Myanmar. So that work definitely paid off. And by now we are lucky enough to have a field station there on the island, which now is also hosting a small, uh, they call it eco resort. So they can host up to 20 people at a time to go on holidays there. And we have one of the bungalows as our field station. So we always have two volunteers there working on the island and taking care of the coral. That's incredible. Do you have photos of this? Because we're going to have to see it. You're going to have to send it over so everyone can check out uh, the uh, amazing progress. Yeah, there's photos of that for one on the website. If you look for the Megui Archipelago project off the part, there's also a couple of the reports that we did on the island. And there's also lots and lots of videos of the island on the YouTube channel. Yeah, because I think that's when I first found you is when you guys were still over there and I was hoping to get over to Myanmar because it's, it's one of those dream destinations, you know, completely untouched. Um, as you said, you got to find all these basically extinct coral, so that's very exciting. But, um, oh, it was definitely a stunning area. The problem was that with being one of the few boats with the permits, it mm -hmm. cost us a few thousand euros every year. Yeah. And at the time, we were 100% funded out of my pocket. So I was basically going back to work in the off-season and then put my money back into this. And the year that I had to give up was the year when me and my decided every time you move the boat, you have to pay an extra $1,000 on top. Oh, really? So that would have meant that I worked for half a year in order to work in Myanmar for a month or so. And then I would have been out of funds. So at that time, I had to stop the boat operations there and then we were lucky enough to be able to knock off this field station on boulder island and yeah i did that for one more year and then realized that i'm basically reaching the end of my wisdom and it mm -hmm. just makes so much more sense to pull in people who are in the coral restoration field and who know a lot more about the coral and put their knowledge to work rather than sitting there and trying to learn everything myself yeah Sometimes it's Plus better it to gives, let the specialists. <laughs> yeah, and it gives new motivated people a chance to do their work there. And you can tell, I mean, it is a lonely island. You will see maybe 20 people in half a year. You don't have access to anything. By now, there's very slow internet there, but you're basically on the end of the world. And it is really exciting and really interesting for about half a year. But once you've done it, you're kind of over it. Yeah, you want to go back to a bit more civilization. <laughs> yeah, even though it sounds very romantic to be on a lonely island, especially if you bring your girlfriend or your wife with you. <laughs> but yeah, there's a limit to everything. And I found my limit after two seasons there. Yeah, I was, um, I was in Africa for eight months and that was slightly bigger. I mean, there were some 20,000 people on the island and the village I was living near was about 3,000 people. Uh, but same thing, you know, like there were, electricity would come on for six, six to eight hours a day. And the only internet you had was like 3G with your phone. Uh, 
very small. That's not too bad. <laughs> no, but it was amazing. But uh, I, I did eight months and I loved it. But I remember like when I was applying for the job because it was in a small like eco retreat as well, like a lodge. And yeah. the boss kept being like, Kat, you know, there's no cinema, right? Or coffee shops or anything like nothing. <laughs> and it's just um, it requires a very special type of person to go to these very isolated locations and just it's yeah, the best that's, experience that's like, just true. being on the beach and hearing the waves every day and being able to dive and see coral and yeah, I remember I had a friend who was also a marine biologist and she went to a small resort in the Maldives to be like the, the marine biologist on the spot who would go snorkeling with the tourists mm -hmm. and the first month she was blown away and was like oh my god it's so beautiful it's absolutely gorgeous amazing coral nice palm trees you can hang out in a hammock and called her again i think two months later she was like, i know every palm tree by name by now <laughs> i've seen every single coral head i'm ready to leave I was like, yeah okay how long is your contract well got 10 months to go oh no <laughs> so by the end of it she wasn't particularly happy anymore but oh yeah it's it it know. all comes with its ups and downs oh, just definitely. like living on a boat can be rewarding at times and it's hell in other times you see, personally, I really, really want to live on a boat. Me and my partner here, um, he comes from a sailing family. Like, he was mm -hmm. born on a boat. So, like, his parents crossed the whole world, basically, on a boat, and then he was born on it. So, we want to get a sailing boat. So, that's one of my big goals, is to save enough money and actually get myself that sailing boat and learn how to sail well enough to be able to do what you guys do, in a way. We get to live on the boat and be in the water every day Ooh, it is a nice life but, i mean <laughs> Definitely i some spent times, the last, i'm guessing <laughs> yeah i mean i spent 15 years of my life on boats by now so mm -hmm. i kind of got used to all the yeah sometimes it's not nice things that get thrown at you and my wife she kind of stumbled into it when she met me and of course, there's times when she loves it. Like you wake up in the morning, gorgeous anchorage, nobody else around. You jump in, you go snorkeling. It's beautiful. But obviously, there's also other times when you have to get into an anchorage in the middle of the night. It's blowing a gale. The anchor is not holding. You stay up all night. All hell is breaking loose around you. Yeah. So, yeah, ups and downs. <laughs> but you get used to it. And boy, the good moments pay for all the crap that happens to you in such an amazing manner. I, I cannot imagine and I can't wait. And hopefully, you know, all the restrictions lift soon so you guys can get back to your boat. And we can maybe get one. <laughs> well, maybe you guys should just come along and visit for a while. Just We'd to see if to. it's really something you want to do. Oh, definitely. It's, it's, it's on the books. Uh, I've, I've been telling him about it for a while so he knows <laughs> he knows it's a possibility um no we're, we're both big divers so we're in the water all the time and like when i was in africa i i got to start doing some data gathering and surveys over there because just like you were saying in myanmar there's just so little information that you know anything you surveyed was like new and helpful <laughs> to just yeah. find out more uh yeah, I also saw so many species that I have never seen before that weren't in any of the books. Um, like I saw an enormous uh, mantis shrimp, I think, mm -hmm. that I have yet to identify. I still, I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so it's just these incredible untouched destinations. Uh, anyway. It, it's pretty stunning though. <laughs> Just going on a bit of a tangent about boats. Um, for people who do want to get involved or help out, um, how can they do that? Or what would be your recommendation for like aspiring marine biologists or people who want to get out on the water or, you know, as, as, a, as a small NGO that's helping all these projects, what would you recommend? Um, for aspiring marine biologists, well, the number one hint is always get your feet wet, get some experience depending on what it is you really want to do for most people for some peculiar reason it is work with dolphins so find yourself an NGO that is working on that and just do an internship 
unfortunately most internships you actually have to pay for which is one of the reasons why i wanted to create an environment where people don't have to pay for it and ended up working non-stop to pay for other people's internships but that is not really a long-term solution so now what we do is everybody shares the running cost of the boat basically mm -hmm. and that's including myself which seems like a fair deal i think um so everybody is obviously welcome to join us on our boat and i think especially for people who want to work or settle down in the mediterranean area it is a great opportunity simply because you can also build a network you get in touch with different ngos with the research groups with the universities um right now i'm also or well, just recently did a post in one of these facebook groups where people who have to wish to get into the field and just call me up and I'm happy to give advice or share contacts. Doesn't matter where in the world you are. After crossing oceans for 15 years, you managed to build quite a good network. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but ultimately you need to get experience. You have to get out there. You have to do something, but even then don't build the illusion of being able to spend all your life at sea a big part of the work of a marine biologist will be on the computer, will be in a laboratory somewhere. I mean, you've been talking to Maria before, who spends mm -hmm. most of her life in the lab. Yeah. I guess yeah. I'm one of the very few lucky ones who actually spends most of his life on the water. But that was a dream job that I have been hunting for for ages. And I, at some point I realized nobody's going to give me the job. So I basically created it myself. Yeah. And it was a 10 year struggle to get to the point where I don't have to pay to work. If that amazing. makes any sense. Yeah, no, it, it is still one of those fields, unfortunately, um, that so many people want to do. And unfortunately, governments and, you know, there's not enough funding or there's not as much funding as we might wish there to be, um, considering how important the oceans are for the health of our planet and for all, all of humanity. Like yeah, funding just, is always the drawback here. Yeah. yeah, that's the hardest part. And I the thing is like the Mediterranean, right? As you said, 20 countries are surrounding it and so many people, I mean, millions of people go there every year for holidays, but they also depend on it financially. And, you know, how, what's the future looking um, like for the Mediterranean? What do you think is going to happen in terms of the marine debris and the lack of fish there? Honestly, I, well, you, you know how they say there's optimists and pessimists among the marine biologists? Yeah. Which one are you? <laughs> I would consider myself an optimist. Otherwise, I would have stopped working a long time ago. <laughs> you got to be because at this point, everyone thinks we're crazy. <laughs> Yeah, if people are still working in the field, they are clearly optimists. Otherwise, they would have just retired somewhere and made themselves a nice life for the couple of years that I left. Yeah. <laughs> now, but for the Mediterranean, simply because I think it is the most threatened patch of water on this planet, um, it has come to the point where I believe that something big has to happen in the next two to three years. And if that doesn't happen and when I say something big, I mean big movement in terms of planting seagrass, in terms of mm -hmm. doing something about invasive species, in terms of getting rid of all the marine debris. And big movement in terms of thousands and thousands of people actually working on it in an active manner. And if that doesn't happen in the next two to three years, I think within the next 10 years, the Met is going to go down a very sad route. But even if we have lost the mat, and that's part of the reason why I went there, if we lose the mat, we can still try everywhere else. I mean, ultimately, the Mediterranean makes up less than a percent of all the salt water on this planet, which is really not a lot. Mm -hmm. But if we manage to somehow save the Mediterranean, we can also save the rest of the planet. Yeah, and we definitely have some sort of models on how to better tackle the issues in the bigger scales. No, and that's one of the beautiful things we saw now in the last couple of weeks. Because if people see the urgency and if they really see a need to do something, all of a sudden the money is there, the willingness is there, everybody cooperates. Or mm -hmm. most people cooperate anyways. That's yeah. just a couple of countries that kind of stand out. 
but we know that we need the ocean. I mean, every second breath that we take comes out of the sea. So everybody should be aware of the fact that we need salt water, we need the ocean, we need them to be alive. So we should also be aware of the fact that we all have to pull together to actually help them out and make sure that they are still around when we get old or when our kids are on this planet. Yeah. So the urgency is there. We just have to really understand it and grasp it. And now we've all seen that we as mankind on this planet are able to make big changes in a very short period of time. So we have to keep up that attitude for other issues. Indeed. Um, well, it's good to know that there's still optimists out there <laughs> uh, fighting for, you know, our seas and oceans. In terms of the seagrass, I've, I've participated in some coral reef restoration projects, but how would a seagrass uh, planting look like? Have you tried in small scales? Like, what are we uh, talking there's about? A, there's a couple of NGOs that are actively working on it, luckily. For some peculiar reason, they also tend not to talk to each other. Luckily, mm -hmm. they all agreed to talk to me and they were all happy for us <laughs> to share the knowledge, which is kind of weird that they need somebody in between to talk to each other. But anyways, the, basically there's two approaches to it. For one, you can actually get pieces of seagrass that have been ripped out, which happens a lot with anchors, with drag nets, with uh, all sorts of shipping issues. And ultimately they tend to get washed up on beaches early in the morning with storms or any rough weather. So that's the one chance you have. You can collect those pieces and actually plant them back into the sea, mm -hmm. which basically means that you take every single piece of seagrass and you have to dive down and put it back onto the ground. And you can't just dig a hole and stick them in. You actually have to anchor them with something in our case it is a u-shaped piece of wire that you just push into the ground and that kind of rusts away over the course of a couple of weeks and then in that couple of weeks the seagrass has a chance to grow its own roots into the sediment again mm -hmm. so that's one and the other one is that every seven years for posidonia oceanica which we have in the mediterranean they grow seeds and All this right. year is actually one of those years, which is part of the reason why it's really important that we get on the water this year. So you can collect those seeds and secure them to the ground, which means you take a well, piece of some natural fiber line and tie them to a rock or tie them to something where they have a good chance of starting to grow. And that gives them a head start because usually all these little seeds, they would get released from the plant, they would start floating. At some point they burst open and start sinking to the ground. And only about 1% of them actually survive. But if you pick them beforehand and you secure them to the ground, you all of a sudden have a success rate of 50%, which oh, with better. a couple of million of seeds makes a big, big difference. And for that, we need a few hundred to a few thousand divers to actually help out with that effort. And that's the big goal for this year. Oh, to hopefully. not just grow a handful of plants, but actually grow a few thousand. Mm. Yeah. Hopefully they let us out <laughs> onto the ocean soon then, because otherwise that would be a shame. How come it happens so rarely? Every seven years, you said? Every seven years. It's just the, the regular way it works with the seagrass for most species, actually. I'm not sure how long the, the cycle is for other species exactly, but for the ones we have in the Met or especially in the Adriatic, it's seven years. And I guess it's the same for the Posidonia that you guys have around Australia. I had no idea. Because uh, yeah, I live, I live near um, Shark Bay, which is the largest area of seagrass in the world. Oh, nice. By near, so, I mean like a 15-hour drive. But <laughs> oh, okay. That close. In Australia, that's close. That's like one of the closest things to me. I live like in the middle of nowhere. That's why okay. this whole situation hasn't really affected us up here because we're just so isolated anyway. <laughs> um, Wait, I thought you were in Perth. No, I'm north. I'm uh, in Karatha, so like six hours north of Ningaloo. Oh, okay. 
So it's absolutely untouched here. I mean, the biodiversity here, I've never seen anything like it. Any given day I'm out there, it's just manta rays, turtles, um, dolphins, oh, wow. humpback whales. Whale sharks don't come in this close where we are, but they're a couple of miles offshore as well. Nice. That sounds good. Last yeah. time I went to Australia, we've only been diving in the Southern Reef, which was absolutely stunning, but no tropical life there. A little bit too chilly. Lots yeah. of seals, though. Yeah, I love the seals. Those are, yeah. those are some of my favorite creatures to dive with, for sure. Yeah, really cute and really exciting the first time. After 30 dives, it's getting a little weird when you come back and chew on your hoses and uh, come on <laughs> just just leave please <laughs> <laughs> yeah this feels weird um no that's very cool thank you so much for um all of all of your insight on the projects you're doing and everything i do want to finish yeah, no off worries. the podcast with the question i ask all of my guests which is what is the one piece of advice you would give to people who want to help our oceans if you want to help the oceans, you better start right now. And it can be any little thing that you decide to do, be it yeah, stop using single-use plastic or every time you walk on the beach, just pick up a few pieces of litter, stop eating seafood. It's every single little thing that you can think of. Just do it and stop talking about it and stop thinking that the little change you make doesn't make a difference because a million people have the same thought. And if everybody just does a little bit, we reach a lot. Very well put. Uh, Manuel, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I hope to see you soon and to hear what you guys are up to. Make sure to let us know once you get back on the boat um, how the projects progress this year. I sure will do. Thank you very much for having me and hope to welcome you on the boat soon. Once again, thank you, Manuel, so much for taking the time to join me here today, getting up nice and early and having the birds sing in the background while you chat to us about your marine conservation NGO. It was an honor. I cannot wait to be on the boat with you and to learn all, uh, all the good and bad things that may happen when you're sailing across the oceans. As always, I also want to say a big thank you to Graham Mose, who is the mind behind the music in this podcast. He is from Brisbane. If you're in Brisbane, go check him out live or support him on the YouTube platform, on Facebook, Graham Mose Music. Check him out. Funky Beats will make sure to get you dancing. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.